He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to Elemental from RNZ. I'm Alison Balance. And I'm Alan Blackman from the Auckland University of Technology. And we are wishing the periodic table of elements a happy 150th birthday with a year-long celebration of all of the elements. And we have made it to the midpoint of the party, and by that I mean the middle of the alphabet, to magnesium. Alphabetically. Alphabetically. (laughs) So, today, folks, magnesium, which is loved by everyone and everything ranging all the way from plants to folk suffering from constipation to boy races. Bit of a crowd favourite then, isn't it? (laughs) Vital stats, please, Professor. OK, so magnesium, elemental symbol MG, atomic number 12, discovered in 1808 by the venerable Sir Humphrey Davy, a very, very famous chemist. I think we've had his name mentioned before. Oh, yes, more than a few times, I think. Mm. Um, he, He was one of the greats. And magnesium lives in group two of the periodic table. Above it is beryllium and below it is calcium. So it's an element that I'm sure you've all heard of. And it is in fact the sixth, a seventh or eighth most abundant element on earth, depending on which book you read. So which do you believe then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's not for me to make that decision, Alison. No. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm glad we're certain on how abundant it is. Magnesium the name. Yeah, interesting one, this. So the name comes from the fact that talc, okay, as uh, we would know as talcum powder, it's a magnesium-containing mineral, and it was found in the magnesia region of Greece. And uh, those of you who remember the iron episode, magnesia was also in western Turkey, and that's how they got the magnet name, if we recall that. So that's where the name comes from, from the Magnesia region of Greece. And the original Magnesia region of Greece got its name from the fact that the Magnetes tribe were situated there. So speaking of places in Europe, uh, magnesium also plays a part in the Dolomites, those wonderful mountains in the north of Italy, if you've ever seen them. Dolomite is in fact a compound with the formula CAMgCO 3 twice, so it's calcium magnesium carbonate otherwise known as dolomite. And, of course, there's lots of dolomite in the dolomites, hence their name. Wonderful. It's one of those elements that health nuts seem to obsess about. Are you getting enough magnesium in your diet? (laughs) Well, probably with good reason, because it is an essential element for most living things. So if you want magnesium, the best place to go is plants, certainly green plants, I guess, because magnesium, and uh, specifically a magnesium 2 plus iron, sits at the heart of the chlorophyll molecule. And as you may know from high school biology class, the chlorophyll molecule is used by green plants to capture solar energy and thereby convert carbon dioxide and water to carbohydrates. And this is a process called... Photosynthesis. There we go, which everyone's heard of, I'm sure. (laughs) So the importance of magnesium in photosynthesis was first demonstrated by a guy by the name of Richard Wilstetter, and that was in 1906, and for this wonderful discovery, he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1915. So magnesium's really at the base of the food chain then, and continues to be important as you go up the food chain? Yes, it is an essential element in humans for good reasons, because it's got a variety of uses in the human body. It's involved in the synthesis of molecules such as ATP, adenosine triphosphate, DNA and RNA, and it's also used in building proteins. So very, very important in the human body. Uh, Also important in the chemistry lab, and I think that listeners might not be so familiar with the name Victor Grignard. However, if you have studied undergraduate chemistry... I must have missed that lecture. (laughs) Doesn't sound very familiar. (laughs) Well, you know, (laughs) he's very famous amongst chemists. And uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery of the very modestly named Grignard reagents. I don't know whether he gave them the name or whether hopefully somebody else did. And these are very unusual molecules that we call organometallic molecules. Now, we've met organic compounds before, and those are compounds made primarily of carbon and hydrogen. Uh, Metallic complexes are obviously molecules that contain metals, so we stick them together, organometallic, And that means that uh, they are made of both carbon-containing compounds and metals, and specifically they've got a bond between the metal and the carbon atom. Very unusual, uh, but they're very, very useful in organic 
synthesis, and they are used very much in the laboratory till this day. Where might our listeners have met magnesium uh, in their travels? Very possibly at sort of primary school or something like that, where the teacher will have lit a piece of magnesium ribbon, and when it burns, it burns with this brilliant, brilliant white light. And in fact, this is remarkable. Magnesium not only burns in oxygen, but when all the oxygen in the air has been used up, it will combine with the remaining nitrogen. So it actually burns in an atmosphere of nitrogen to give a thing called magnesium nitride. Not only that, it even burns in an atmosphere of carbon dioxide and also underwater as well. Good gracious. How on earth does it do yeah. that? That's amazing. No, that's, that is. That's very, very cool. How do you put it out then? Ah, good question. So really the only way that you can put out burning magnesium is to use sand. You certainly don't use water because that just generates hydrogen and then you end up with an explosion. Let's say it burns at a very, very high temperature. It's hard to put out. And so, of course, the military got onto that and thought this would be a good idea to put in bombs. And so magnesium was the basis of incendiary bombs in World War II. Now, this flammability, it's not that that makes it beloved of boy races, is it? Uh, no. <laughs> well, just talking about magnesium metal burning there, uh, in fact, it's rather hard to get it to burn if it's sort of not finely divided or if you're not heating it at high temperature. And also when you alloy it with aluminium, and what you end up with there is a very, very strong and lightweight metal, and that is what your mag wheels are made of. You also find magnesium used extensively in the construction of cars and aircrafts and bicycles, and uh, particularly in the latter, you can actually cast the whole bike frame from magnesium, and so therefore you don't have any welds or anything like that, no joins, and so you've got a very, very, very strong bike frame from that. On a completely different note... Um, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, indeed. So a thing called milk of magnesia that perhaps some listeners might be familiar with, and uh, that's actually just another name for magnesium hydroxide, and that's also very good for indigestion and constipation. When I say it's good for constipation, it means it relieves it, it doesn't give you it. <laughs> and also, possibly the place where most uh, listeners may have heard of magnesium is in a thing called Epsom salts. And Epsom salts got their name because in the year 1618, there was a farmer by the name of Henry Wicker, and he was looking for a place to water his cattle because uh, apparently the summer of 1618 in good old Blighty was rather warm. Bit of a drought. So he was walking upon Epsom Common. He found a pond there and all the cows were avoiding this pond like the plague even though they were very, very thirsty. He tasted the water. It tasted very, very bitter. What he did find then was that the water in this pond was very good for healing sores. And so the bitterness actually came from the presence of what we today call Epsom salts, or if you're a chemist, you call it magnesium sulfate. And indeed, Epsom salts also apparently very good for curing constipation. That's useful for constipation in many ways. Uh, Epsom <laughs> salts, I think you can also use them as bath salts and yep. as fertiliser, because I water my lemon tree with it. Ah. Now, that's my interesting fact for this episode. What's yours? <laughs> Well, often English phrases, I never quite know what they mean or where they came from. So there's a common phrase here that I'm sure everyone's heard of, when it rains, it pours. And this apparently came from the Morton Salt Company in the USA, and they used this in 1911 as an advertising slogan because what they did uh, was to add magnesium carbonate to their table salt. And as you know, when table salt gets wet, it doesn't pour very well. If you put magnesium carbonate in it, it makes it free-flowing. So ergo, when it rains, it pours. I suspect, though, that must have been a riff on some original saying, because isn't there another saying, you know, it never rains but it pours? Yes, I still don't know what that means either. No, neither do I, but I wonder if when it rains it pours, can we make that our motto somehow? Elemental, doesn't just rain chemistry, it pours. No? Elemental, the free-flowing chemistry podcast. Oh, I like that. Oh, good. Never mind. It's clearly why I don't work in advertising. <laughs> On that basis, it's a good thing that we're giving Elemental away, isn't it? <laughs> For free as a podcast. <laughs> Check us out at rnz.co.nz slash chemistry. Or you can do the subscribe thing on your favourite app to ensure a free-flowing stream of episodes Lovely. coming your way twice a week. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you'll find us there. We'll be back soon with manganese, but until then, it's goodbye from me, Alison Balance. 
and me, Alan Blackman. Matewa.